Muted. Good morning. This is the OGM call for 11 May 2023. Jerry is uh, elsewhere, so I'm taking the con, and this is a check in call. So we will open the floor to anyone who'd like to check in. So, Doug, before we started, I just wanted to clear up a possible misconception. I don't know if it is or not, but it was suggested that because you hadn't responded to one of the sense making calls that maybe you were too busy or not interested. And I was thinking that it was just that you were away. So I just wanted to clear that up. Well, I was in the process of getting ready to travel and then travel. Uh, and I am now away being in Montenegro uh, on the Eastern shore of the Adriatic. So my question is in the future, are you interested in the part of it that's dealing with um, regeneration well, maybe Klaus could explain the, the book part I'm speaking about and find out if you're interested in contributing. Look, we're still we're still trying to um, to follow this concept that we discussed, where we use the concept of garden world to define this as a destination uh, for the future, what the world should look like or how we can protect ourselves mitigate against climate change and adapt to it, right? So what would that look like? And then we can separately come, uh, talk about the journey from here to there. But but at this well, point- Well, I'm, I'm very interested in participating uh, because of where I am, time is tricky because so much of it's at midnight. <laughs> but the basic idea, I mean, I'm convinced that Garden World works under any scenario. It's a, it's a and I don't think of it as necessarily the goal, but as a way station towards a future which is unknown and that is emerging. Right. But it's a fairly safe place to go and it's attractive because it blends gardens and habitat together in the same place. So it's safe for children, pets, old people like me, uh, and artists. And uh, it's just, it's a good thing. So, uh, I think that the amount of energy in the world going towards regenerative agriculture is increasing very rapidly. The language is spreading very rapidly, yeah. which is very encouraging. And I just would love to see Garden World as part of it. So we get away from imagining landscapes that are agricultural without people in them. Blending the people into the way we plant, grow, and harvest is really important. I think of the wonderful picture by Bruegel, some of you might know it, of this group of farmers having a picnic next to the hayfield that they've been mowing. Uh, it's so evocatively wonderful. Anyway, so yes, the answer is I want to participate. Okay. Nudge me if I seem to be missing it. Well, that's why I wanted to clear that up because now we'll make it a priority to find a time that works. Thanks. Good. Doug, what, what is the time difference from the West Coast? Is it nine or 10 hours? Uh, it's eight, I think. Eight, okay. So it's it's eight eight, eight o'clock here. What, what do you got? You're uh, four o'clock there? or Five. Five, okay, so it's five nine hours. Nine hours, okay. So you're in Central European time. Nine? Okay. All right, well, welcome everybody. This is our weekly check-in call. I'm uh, not Jerry Mikulski, but I'm standing in for him. We're sitting in for him. Um, floor is open who'd like to check in and we will use the s protocol of pausing between uh, people speaking kevin please thanks i gotta go in a bit um yeah the, i live in uh swananoa in the swananoa watershed and the town of black mountain has been given uh two parcels uh, that equal 50 acres that they they, they're letting the creative group, not the park service and not the city sort of design. And they're having a three hour thing tomorrow, <clears throat> a meeting, you know, it took up three hours on Saturday, but they want to uh, be open to any new idea. And this, this, uh, this group, it's, it's a group of activists who then formed uh, as the trails and greenways and park sort of group. Um, they're interesting. They've done like a story uh, trail around the lake, you know, with histories and stuff. And they do, they walk you through neighborhoods and with history and stuff. And um, 
you know, I'm exploring the idea of being sort of involved as a citizen, even though it takes three hours. And uh, it's just kind of interesting um, because this, this is land that is not easy to integrate, which makes it sort of interesting. They're gonna have to create access to it. There's a private rail crossing, there's a tunnel under the highway. And so, but you know, that means that it won't be used like other land because you know, you'll have to park and walk a good ways to get there or something, you know, it, it won't be easily accessible, but it's really super interesting land. And one was a, 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 a uh, a subdivision that went bust that never started and an old lady's bequest and <clears throat> they, they happened to be kind of stitched together next to each other and just uh, the idea of sitting in three hours where they want you to have different ideas about imagination that could last for 50 years if you stick with the process is, is an interesting thing and I'm I'm I've decided it's worth giving up three hours and I'll see how I stay engaged, but I think it's, it's an interesting idea. There's a request from Stacy, if you can put a, a link to There's this. no call, it's, it's showing up for three hours. Uh, okay. There may be a call when you get there, but this is, this is three hours of people. Got it. Yeah. Well, please report back, let us know how it goes. Yeah. It's so hard to be patient enough to be an active citizen. <laughs> That's cool. Yeah. Yeah, it's something else to be an active citizen. <clears throat> I did have um, actually a really good week last week. Uh, we did a presentation to the biofuel sector. And uh, I'm... I'm here are my speaker notes. You can see that I was very blunt you know, in the way that uh, we addressed this call. And this was hosted by an online magazine, which is the largest of its kind publication. They have a very large uh, international uh, circulation uh, to, to the biotech sector and biofuel sectors. And there were two there were two things that came out of him, out of that conversation that really surprised me. I was speaking for about fifteen minutes. My, my partner also so combined we spoke like twenty minutes. Um, so my partner is from the biofuel has a biofuel background. He was a CEO of a biofuel company, billion dollar company, uh, and he's also so like me, you know, reformed. Oh my God, what did we do? Kind of thing. Um, so there were two things that came out of it. First of all, about 40% of U.S. corn and 11% of U.S. soy is used for biofuels. That is now in direct competition with the food supply. Because the, when, you, when you see, when you think of the Ukraine, you think of uh, the crop outages and, and, and yield reductions we had last year, uh, the food supply is really precarious already. So... This is just, I mean, it's just not sustainable you know, to use food crops for biofuels. So there are other crops that, that you can use. You, know, you can use uh, 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 oil seeds or cover crops you know, or, or uh, uh, grasses, you know, the, 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 the perennial grasses that don't, that don't compete with the food supply. But that work requires coordination with the regular agricultural sector. So this was the first time that I'm aware of that we actually had a conversation between biofuels, which is running totally on its own track, and the farm sector, farm and food sector in the regenerative uh, crop. So that was that was you know, a, a pretty amazing. Then the other thing was, now these were all mostly engineers, right? Uh, and one of them all of a sudden got the idea. So how does this work? How do you, how does agriculture put carbon into the ground? Or through photosynthesis. Well, photosynthesis is direct air capture when you think about it, right? I mean, it captures, uh, it screens the air and pulls carbon and nitrogen out of it. So the engineering minds were going, oh my God, you know, this is, uh, uh, this, and, and we in, in the deck, we inserted that how many gigatons of carbon you could sequester on an annual basis, you know, if you really deploy regenerative agriculture at scale. Or, or, or deploy photosynthesis on a broader level, including reforestation and, and wilding and stuff like that. 
So, so that was for them, you know, that, that, that ensued the debate what a waste of money it is to develop direct air capture technology. And there are billions of dollars in the Inflation Reduction Act allocated to that technology. It's a complete waste. You know, it's, I mean, they were explained, and one of, one of the engineers explains how impossible it is, you know, to use that technology to make an impact because you would bankrupt yourself in the process of building you know, so much capacity. So anyway, um, so now we're, we're, we, are, we are moving forward with uh, this, this, uh, um, this mind, this model, you know, this, this picture of, a, a, uh, of bioregions to be developed you know, in the, for, for, for um, for the environment to become the responsibility of the community and to have the food supply work around this and, and deal with the restrictions, limitations, and potential you know, of a bioregion. So, so I thought that was pretty cool. And, and uh, um, that, that was, I mean, from, from the world that I'm listening in on, that was a major breakthrough. So that was a good one. Klaus, who were the people in the audience that you were speaking to? What kind of people were there? So they were mostly engineers, uh, and and uh, and uh, so the biofuel sector, you know, uh, not just engineers, but also salespeople and you know, the plant managers, and so people involved in the biofuel sector, and then in biotech. So biotech is, <clears throat> for example, making uh, fertilizers out of uh, biomass, you know, things like that. Um, so, so, and, and then materials that are made are made with this bio uh, reaction. Now. So, were there any policy people in there? Anybody making policy or government oh, yeah. representation? No, I don't think that. I mean, this was a very technical group, um, but they were aware of legislation on their way. And this is really another important learning, right? You, you, uh, which, which yesterday I had a meeting you know, here locally. You have people who are getting into the into the business. You now they, they want to innovate stuff. They have a new product. You know they want to create something. People just don't know about how the political process works. You know, and so here in Oregon right now in Salem, you know, there are several bills on the table that would assist farmers to get into the market, for example, to get market access. Right. So, so they are they, they, the legislative process is nebulous to to most people, and my point is, you know, when you have um, business associations and you know catering to startups and innovators and so on, you have to pay attention to the regulatory process that hems you in, you know, and you may need to have a change, then you need to know who to talk to to make a change, you know, in the and this is super local because. Much of the restrictions are the local zoning laws, you know, uh, things of that sort. So, so uh, uh, and and this is true to be a citizen, right? You have to be now educated on the political process. And so, mm -hmm. and I think it's a big wake up time for everybody right, right now to say, what are these guys cooking up then in in Washington, but then also in your state, which impacts your business and impacts your your way of life. And what kind of reception did you get when you were went with them? Were these people going, "You're right," or in denial, or resisting, or what's? Are they open to this? How's it? How's it being received? Your message? It was. It was awesome. I, I was so not prepared to have such a positive uh, reception to the topic because what I was putting out there, when you look at my slides, was basically, you know, without food, without fixing agriculture. <laughs> you may as well forget anything else you do because you know it's going to push us beyond two uh, percent by far. You know? mm -hmm. and so to and and to change agriculture means you have to change the entire system because agriculture is deeply embedded in the global economy, right? I mean, everything oh. you touch it, it somehow involves uh, the natural world around you. you now, so so. Uh, no, they were ready, you know, I mean, they were super skeptical on this uh, air, air uh, capture <laughs> technology that's being pushed on them, you know, but, and, and, uh, um, yeah, no, it was, it, it, and, and totally like, yeah, we understand the food supply has issues, you know, and we can't take food, turn it into biofuel, particularly when you use irrigation water for it, 
um no i was i was uh i was blown away actually by how well that went that's exciting oh, that's great news so thank you for sharing that So everybody, we're doing check-in. Where is the psychoanalyst who can tell us what's happening? <laughs> so, so that's a great prompt, Doug. And I will, I will courageously pick up on that, okay? Um, and I was, I was thinking about this be, even before the prompt. Um, in some ways, I think we're at a juncture that the human species has never been at before. Um, I don't think there's ever been a level of um, mass destruction that human beings have caused to the environment. <laughs> and, um, you know, the, the, I mean, the metaphor that I always use is that we're killing the goose that laid the golden egg. I mean, you know, the natural world of which we are very, very much a part of um, is so critical to our survival. You know, it's our home. Um, and so, you know, class, that was a great story because I think that more and more people are um, are waking up to this fact that um, business as usual um, can't go on. Um, you know, it's interesting. I had a metaphor in my own life with a major health challenge that I'm dealing with right now. And it's kind of like, you know, <clears throat> life in its existing form has to change. Uh, it can't go on the way it is. And so as we kind of awaken to this fact, um, it demands all of our creativity and our innovation. And, you know, who knows what it's going to, what, what, it, what, it, what it might look like and where it's going to go. Nobody knows. Um, the other point that I want to share by way of personal check-in is I was, I was, sitting and reading the other day, a couple of days ago. And I, I live right on the bay and it was about five o'clock in the afternoon and the water was kind of lapping in. And I looked out and there were the plants and I just had this incredible feeling about how nature gives. Nature just gives and gives and gives and gives and asks for nothing in return. It's just an incredible example of aliveness. Um, uh, yeah. And I watched, I don't know if anybody has seen the movie Aware. Um, it's about, I was going to post it in the OGM chat um, because it's all about consciousness and um, revealing experiments of um, the consciousness and language of plants. <laughs> it's just some amazing, amazing stuff. I mean, language, like audible language. Um, so that's my check-in. Mm -hmm. Thank you, Stuart. Oh, one more thing. I also, Doug, I sent you a private message because it, it related to Garden World. Um, I just read something about the um, Tainos Society. I don't know if anybody knows about the Tainos Society, T-A-I-N-O-S. It's the society in, um, in Mexico that um, when the Mexican, con when the Spanish conquerors came over, you know, uh, uh, Columbus time, they found this beautiful society um, that existed without war, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. Um, so there's precedent for Garden World. 
<laughs> Historic precedent. Mm -hmm. You can find a lot more historic precedent for Garden World if you read The Dawn of Everything. That too. Mm -hmm. Yeah. That too. Well, I'll, I'll check in then. Um, I mean, it wouldn't be my normal check in, but Ken, you posted an interesting article on the OGM list. It was about Mississippi learnings. And what I was particularly interested in was the pitfalls he mentioned in creating systems change. And the reason it's coming to mind now is one of the pitfalls trying to think of the words he used, had to do with, let me see if I had the actual term. It had to do with um, pitfalls of abstraction, making what we are doing too intellectual and, and inaccessible. Um, and what I liked about Klaus's, I, wa I watched Klaus's presentation. And what I liked about it is it made it really accessible to me. So I walked away all of a sudden thinking about sunflower seeds and how a simple thing like changing recipes to sunflower seeds and how, you know, creating a demand for sunflower seeds could possibly influence why people would start growing different things, you know, just sparking different ideas and I think just having access to these kinds of talks, which I didn't have access to 10 years ago, is such a positive thing. So I just wanted to mention that. That's what's coming to my mind right now. Thanks, Stacey. Yeah. Um, for everybody who's interested, um, I've never met Curtis in person, but we've been friends on Facebook for years. And now I'm not on Facebook, but I'm still connected on LinkedIn. Oh. It was just something called the Interaction Institute. And they do a lot of, um, Actually, Klaus, you might be interested in they do a lot of local food stuff, uh, especially in New England, food safe New England. And um, he's a great facilitator and he posts really interesting things. So connect with Curtis Ogden, O-G-D-E-N on LinkedIn or follow him. He's just he posts really interesting stuff from uh, from his work. And he's still on Facebook. I'm sure he is. Yeah, um, that's where I do my connecting. Yeah. Uh, <laughs> But this this thing about abstraction really struck me. Anybody who's been looking at my posts on uh, the OGM list knows I'm really, right now I'm very captivated by Manfred Max Neef's thinking, uh, Chilean economist. And you know, he came and got a PhD in economics at Cal Berkeley and taught here for a while. And then he started grumbling about the World Bank and the IMF being a terrible thing. And Berkeley kind of invited him to go elsewhere. So he went back to Chile and said, you know, I'm standing knee deep in the mud with a peasant in in chile and i realized nothing that i've learned about economics is useful to him there's nothing i can say to this guy nothing because everything that i learned is about abstraction and i had to invent a new language uh for economics and that was his you know experiments what he called barefoot economics um and it's like you know when you live and work with people in poverty you discover these people are amazingly creative. You cannot be an idiot and survive if you're living in poverty. You're constantly having to invent things and figure out how can I get this and how do I do that? And it, it was eye-opening to him, you know, that that we write people off who are in extreme poverty as, you know, subhuman. And it's like they are some of the most creative humans that he talks a lot about how you often find in impoverished communities. I'm putting that kind of in quotes because it's they're impoverished financially, but 
their quality of life that they they have tremendous capability of sharing it's very much like garden world you know where whatever you have you you share because that's how you make stone soup that's how everybody gets around gets gets to survive so um i'm very intrigued by how we're going to recognize that giving rich people access to the world's resources so they can burn them up and that they won't be there for future gener generations is starting to dawn on people as not such a good idea and there's got to be a better way um and there's some interesting stuff coming out of south america where marginalized communities who have been resisting um the dominant culture of of neoliberal economics and you know world bank and imf comes in and sets up these debt programs to take all the resources out it's huge resistance to that and it's very carefully thought out and academically and actually rigorous and it's just really interesting to read about so it's kind of where uh that sort of fits in for me with the stuff that um curtis was posting doug please uh doug yeah i um stacy was part of uh an experiment that a friend of ours in in germany was doing here um, which was a gathering where an individual was given sort of space and time to share where they were at and to have inquiry into where they were at and then appreciation circle on the heels of that. And we had a person drop in from rural Africa who was contending with um, the flood that had just taken out like six months worth of work. And, and I forget the, the, you know, the connection and web that had him converge with this. Um, but I remember him sharing toward the end of the session how amazed he was that a group of people had the time to come together and do what we were doing. That, that there was the space, there was the leisure, there was <laughs> the, the um, complete, um, just insane luxury of being able to do that. And he had never experienced that or seen that or been exposed to that before. And, and, and he shared, it's just sort of mind blowing to me that um, this exists, that you people can come together, that you can do this. There was no judgment in it. There was just, um, shock and awe at it, <laughs> which I think is sort of another version of what you just shared with him standing in the field saying, I got nothing for this guy. And the flip side of that is, you know, you know, if 8 billion of the population of the planet are concerned with next meal and with survival and with the fundamentals. Um, abstractions uh, don't, don't map to meaning or value in any way. So I just, I just wanted to share the turning of the telescope on that. I'm complete. Thank you.
That's Patty, please. Um, I will, I don't know that I have much to check in around other than there's um, just a, a project I'm working on um, that I could use. Um, I'm looking for examples of governance systems that use power in a way that seems to contribute to the health of um, all humans within that system. Um, anything from, it doesn't matter the size of the governance system or the population that is um, using the system or involved in the system, um, but I am on the lookout for examples of governance systems that seem to use power in a way that supports and um, contributes to the health of all involved. So if anyone has ideas around that, that would be helpful for me in my project right now. And I don't know that I have anything else to check in around right now. Can you give us a little bit more context? Like, are you looking for organizational examples, uh, governance, you know, um, elected representation? Uh, you know, what what specifically would be most useful to you? Thank you. That's a, that's a helpful clarifying question. Um, I need to think about it for a moment. Sure, take your time. I had a thought recently about this, uh, which is that uh, in our society right now, many people are hurting. If the society was organized as a well-meaning corporation, what happens in a corporation if there's a problem lower down in the organization, the ethic is that you pass it up to the level that can do something about it. You don't let it fall fe uh, fester. Uh, that would be organizational hierarchy at its best. Uh, there's a lot wrong with it, but that's also pretty interesting. And we don't have that in society. I would add on to that, Doug. Uh, I'm working with a company right now that it's a $15 billion organization, and they really seem to understand the principle of subsidiarity, which is ensuring that wherever the problem exists, the local at the local level, the local people have the ability to deal with it. They don't have to raise things up and wait and go through channels. So, um, you know, they're doing a lot of work around um, uh, providing middle managers with coaching opportunities and, and helping them to understand influence as opposed to power, because, you know, you have to influence people who you are, are not, they're above you, you have no, no direct line of authority with them. And so how can you get them to engage with what your project is and support you? Um, and I think that's another aspect of um, power tends to consolidate. And the principle of subsidiary is trying to distribute power. So it's a very dynamic tension that, you know, if you have people in the system who want power, very hard to get them to let go of it and, and distribute it to where it needs to go because they want to control everything. Uh, so that might also be a way to look at where is this happening. And um, maybe Kevin has some insight on this, you know, he's working a lot with local watershed groups, which seem to be, we need the power to, to restore our watershed right here on the ground. What can we do? Um, Kevin, you got any thoughts about that? Well, yeah, we got kind of, uh, I was, had to be absent for about two months when I was working on the conference and we got kind of taken over by a UN veteran who reduced it to a talking group and disbanded the working groups. And then people have, uh, you know, from 15 where there are three people and um, he was called on it last week and it may not meet today, but the, it's splintering what's happening is that there's a guy in east Asheville that wants to do a swan networked group with his because people there there is a new walkway to the river uh and so they want to be involved in it and, and so there are groups it, it it's like the, the the core got rotten and it's splintering and there's a group that's going to meet at 5 30 that doesn't work for other people and so it's the thing that we're doing is splintering and and the and the guy uh, the little potentate i think is going to have nobody there <laughs> at the three o'clock meeting so it's a it's a really wild kind of thing uh it's the kind of thing that would have made me angry earlier and i just sort of um, when it, there's another guy he's gotten a, a grant to be a, a community organizer to have a hundred conversations one-on-one -on -one with folks to figure out what to build a sense and respond kind of network. And I said, I want to help him. And I didn't think this group under this guy's leadership was going to go 
do anything. And he said, why aren't I being in the umbrella group? And he just stood up and flipped out and started making big umbrellas in his hand with his hands. You know, I want, why am I not that? And it was just like, you know, very odd. I mean, he, he, he's always seen, you know, the UN people seem calm when they're passive aggressive and, and they smile. That's just part of what you learn. You know, uh, you, you have to say you're doing more and hide the fact that you're doing less. And so it, it, the fact that he erupted and then afterwards, I mean, this is just in the story. He does not seem to have remembered it. And people have asked him about it. And, and he just said, well, and he's in an email to me saying, I wasn't quite as compassionate as I should have been. I was like, dude, you delivered a passive aggressive attack and stood up and, and, and stomped around. But he doesn't seem to remember it. So anyway, that's so it's, you know, it, 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 something's happening. And, and a bunch of those folks are showing up at the planning meeting about this 50 acres who are real smart. And they've been with riparian groups, you know, Riverlink and other kinds of they've been some have been professional watershed managers uh, with nonprofits and stuff. So we'll see. I don't know. Thanks, Kevin. Patty, did you want to? Yeah, um, I just wanted to, Gil uh, type something in the chat. And I'm, I'm just curious, Gil, if you could, um, if you're able to unmute and share a little more about what you just said. Power is always granted, yielded as much as taken. If you're able to come on that, I'd love to hear more. Um, yeah, I don't know how much more I can say about that, but that's 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 been striking me lately. We think about people seizing power, but yield to the seizing of power. Um, I, 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 was it Gregory Bateson when he was talking about the about the fallacy of the of using the metaphor of force in human relations? It's, you know, force is a physics phenomenon, uh, and it, it it and nobody ever forces anybody to do something. Someone presents you with consequences, and you make choices about that. Someone puts a gun to your head. You're not forced to do something. You choose to not die and yield. Uh, and so that's an extreme example, but uh, I think about it very much in the context of the color revolutions uh, and when the legitimacy of a state just evaporates at some point because people will not put up with it anymore and are no longer so afraid of the consequence. I mean, you look at Iran, they're like they executed 60 people in the last week or two, but people are still going at it. Um, uh, so it, 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 the thought's not well formed, but it's kind of around that, about stepping us out of the notion of they made me do this. I mean, it's even there in our, in our, in our everyday speech, of like, you know, he made me feel this way. No, no, mm. he thinks. And I feel this way, which both recaptures the agency, but is also ontologically, I think, more valid, certainly more useful of like, he did shit that I hate. What do I do now? Um, so uh, that, 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 that's not, you know, that's not syntactically clean and complete, but that's sort of where I am with that. That's why I'm raising that. Power is very mysterious. Um, and, um, and maybe it has some of its own dynamic. Uh, there, there, something happens about power in organizations, but I suspect it's not the most important conversation. And I'm much more interested in what do people really care about and how do they coordinate their actions around the things they care about to take care of the things they care about. And power is one traditional way that we do that or that some of us take care of the things that we care about. And you're raising the question about how do we get more of us in the story? you know, And what kinds of structures, processes, relationships, agreements, um, um, power structures do we design that help us do that better? That's what I got for the moment. Is that helpful at all? Or, yeah. or, does, it, or, does, it, or does it generate new problems? Generate well, Gil, uh, looking at it from the historical side, yeah. the words like energy and force and so on in Greek always had to do with human relationships. And mm. they move from the description of the human into the physical world over and time. Now back from physics to human in a sloppier way. Interesting. I think, I think you know, it generates um, the juncture that we're at, that we absolutely need to learn how to do that because the way we have been being, and this is, you know, this is a, a, a page out of Doug B's book, um, you know, the way we've been being isn't working 
So we need to learn how to be a different way with each other. Otherwise, you know, there is no hope. <laughs> there may not be any hope anyway, but that's a longer conversation. <laughs> Well, hope, hope may not be the most useful concept here. No, no, no. When, um, <clears throat> I use that in that word in quotes. It's not about, it's not about, you know, when I use the word hope, it's, you know, Joanna Macy's, you know, activist hope, you know. Um, I think, I think Rebecca Solnit says that hope is not so much a prediction as a stance. Yeah. Didn't somebody say hope floats? Hmm. Eric Fromm once said, don't hope for what already is, and don't hope for what never can be, and don't worry if it doesn't happen in your lifetime. Hmm. Well, could you put that in the chat, Doug? I'm not a chat person, so I'm not going to do that. <laughs> I'll, get, I'll get it out of the transcript some other time. Good. I can repeat it. That's okay. Got it. Don't don't hope for what already is, and never and don't hope for what never can be, and don't worry if it doesn't happen in your lifetime. Right. And as some of you know, I find chat very disruptive of the process of being conscious and letting things filter into the proper level. Please, please forgive me for raising the bugaboo. Mr. B, floor is yours. But you got to unmute if you want us to hear you. So um, I've spent like the last five years studying groups and, and why they do what Kevin just described. Um, and actually wrote a medium piece called Why Do Great New Groups Go Flat? <laughs> um, and in service to this idea of doing us differently and doing us better, um, the universe is this creation machine and we get exactly and literally what we ask for. And so if, an, if your inquiry, Patty, starts with the meme of power, then you're gonna get power. Um, if you are curious about how, what replaces what has been known as governments and power structures in um, people co-creating together in hierarchies or other, if, you're, if your inquiry is how do we do that differently, how do we do that better, then um, you don't invite power to the party. Like that's one of the first things at the top of the list is uh, whatever the new is, I don't want any of that mm -hmm. to be a feature of whatever the emergent new is. Mm -hmm. So um, when you take that out of the equation um, and power sort of extends into power control over authority, right? So you need, the minute you invoke power, you have somebody who has it over somebody who doesn't. Otherwise, it doesn't exist conceptually, semantically, meaning-wise. Um, if you take it out of the equation, um, it means that um, you sort of need to be shift into something that's much more peer-to-peer -peer in nature, decentralized, um, much more organic and biological in terms of sensing, feeling into what is needed by who, where, when. Um, and then how does a collective respond to that? So it's really a complete inversion and a complete transformation of the orientation of the way you're looking at how you're doing what you're doing with others and how they're looking at it and the way they're doing it with you. 
and consent sort of arises out of that emergently as a, as a governing principle. But it's consent in relation to individual agency as part of a collective effort or collaboration and negotiating and navigating all that. So for what that's worth. <laughs> Thanks, Doug. Um, I could I could offer a little more context around the question I had posed um, earlier in the meeting. And I think this, I, I'm afraid this isn't going to, um, these are really unfinished ideas. And um, I'm, I'm afraid I'm not gonna be able to articulate them as clearly as I'd like, but um, just as, as a thought exercise, what I've been playing around with is the idea that um, power, whatever that word means, because I think that can mean a lot of different things to different people. Um, but let's say for our purposes, power, not just in the more how it's traditionally spoken of or understood sense of, you know, the, you know, billionaire's wealth um, authority, you know, that, that power over power that we tend to speak of, but also the intrinsic power, personal power that we um, many are, you know, I'd like to think we're born with, it's fairly universal. Um, and I think people have access to it to different degrees for different reasons and different circumstances. But for our purposes, what is the underlying, <clears throat> I, I just I just can't help but think that they're probably something close to like laws of physics that govern power transfer and power, um, uh, yeah, let's say power equalizing and power transfer between two people, but also within ourselves. And I'm really curious around what uh, governs that transfer internally, what dictates the, the um, movement of personal power, how we relate to ourselves and our own power, how we relate to other people and their power. Um, and I, I, I'm curious around whether or not, um, I think the uh, Monday, no, the Friday Society 2045 group heard me speak on this a little bit, but I um, am curious around how much personal power is actually a biological um, necessity for life, right? And so if personal power is or acts as a homeostatic function, does that change, I don't know, does, does that, might that inform what is actually dictating how power moves between um, humans, how we perceive power? Um, and so the question earlier about looking for governance structures that exemplify, let's say power being used in a healthful way. I'm curious if there's a um, micro and macro relationship between healthy power use. So is, does there exist a governance structure where power is being used or moving in a way that actually supports the entire system? And I just was looking for examples of that so I could kind of try to see if something like that could exist within one person, how power is managed within oneself. So that, I don't know if that, if that actually gives um, clear context, it may not, but that was um, a little more of the intention behind the question. And that's where my curiosity is. Yeah. That might have just made things more confusing, but that's where I'm at. So I know Gillen and Kevin have their hands up. Is this to respond to Patty or something else? So let's respond to Patty first. So it, it's to respond to Patty, and I can go into check into my check Please. or not. It's not. So it, it's just a little thing. Okay. So me. Okay. So Patty, I, I, I like unfinished thoughts. That uh, unfinished thoughts need no apology. Uh, you're in the inquiry, and it's a bunch of big questions. And I suspect that there is a question beneath or within the question that you're asking, and perhaps one be, be beneath or within that one. And so my invitation to you, rather than responding to the question, is to invite you to just sort of go deeper into the question and peel it down and peel it down and see what it is. What's good. Because um, this is a realm where the questions may be more valuable than the answers. So um, that thought. Um, um, I, that said, I'm personally wary of the direction that you just spoke about because you know we, we're not billiard balls. And power means something very different on a billiard table than on a basketball court than in a you know, complex adaptive biological system. And so 
looking for the analogies may be illuminating and it may be really misdirecting. And so I have a, just a big caution on that for me. Maybe not for you, but that's kind of where I go with that. Um, and um, that's what I have to respond. I've got check-in, but I'll wait because there's other hands up here. I'd like to drop my little thing in. The guy from the UN <clears throat> has written multiple books about compassion and some have been translated into whatever they speak in Nepal. And the, uh, the, the most passive aggressive guy that I know like him has also written books about compassion and once had a network of 25 compassionate cities. So it's like if somebody has written a book about compassion, I have now become wary just mm -hmm. for whatever it's worth. Yeah, I just wanted to jump in real quickly and say to everything Patty just said, without going into detail, that I think people like Patty and me that look like Patty and me are going to see this issue from a different direction. And I'm just going to leave that there. Stuart, before you go, I just want to respond to Stacey. As this conversation has been unfolding, I keep thinking about testosterone and what that does for power versus estrogen. So just throw that in. <laughs> and I just wanted to um, make sure I threw in the distinction between um, you know, personal power and, and positional power, um, which is just a, a kind of a critical piece. And and you know, the more I roam around in the world, the more that I see um, the lack of people exerting gravitas of real personal power. And, and that I think is one of the things that is just so missing in the context we're, we're operating in right now. I mean, um, it's just, it's, it's, it's just not present. I mean, you know, the idea that, the idea where, that- where, where, where are you looking? Where am I looking? Where are you looking and not seeing this? Oh, in the in the in the in the um, in the public forum, okay, in the traditional public forum, it's not it's not present in our in our politic. It's not present. Did you watch uh, CNN last night? Oh yeah, yeah. uh huh, a absolutely. Um, and 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 that's a that's a good example, Gil. I didn't I almost didn't want to bring that in, but the fact that um, that a major political party in the U.S., i.e. Republicans, that there's nobody standing up and just coming from a place of, of, of ethic, a place of morality, a place of um, seeing is, is not calling Trump out and that this is the leading candidate for a major political party. But, but you didn't say there was no you know, ethic. You said there was no power and gravitas and Trump is certainly exercising power and doing it rather masterfully. Uh, y y yes. And, okay. <laughs> He's also doing it in a manipulative, yeah, yeah, yeah. untruthful, yeah, yeah. All um, yeah. unethical yes, so. way. But you said there's, that you're not seeing power. No, I'm, I said that I'm not. I'm not seeing personal power exercised in a way that's pushing back against the kind of stuff that Trump is is it, the shenanigans that he's pulling off. Okay, gotcha. Okay? That there's not a strong that there's not a strong voice. That there's not a, a real strong voice about Clarence Thomas. Um, I mean, it, it's just it, it's almost it's almost un, unfathomable. It's comical. In a certain in a certain way, that there's not a great voice out there pushing back against that kind of stuff. But there, there, there is not that there is not a, a strong push against him. There is active support. I mean, it's even yeah. worse. It makes it even worse. I know. Yeah, but, <laughs> I mean that CNN town hall, which I thought was brilliant because. They, they stocked it with Trump supporters. So the audience was full of Trump supporters who were 
who were laughing and clapping at things that we find just a horror show, right? Right. It really, it really shows there is like what 20, 30 percent of the population who embrace that and, and promote it. That's the scary part. Yes, I, I agree. I agree completely. Stuart, this is why I asked, where is your gaze? Because you say there's nobody speaking out against Trump. I mean, my my feed this morning and last night was filled with people, including tons of journalists, including journalists from CNN, denouncing that show. Uh, I'm, I see tons of people on the ass of Clarence Thomas, including the Frontline show the other night. So when you say no one is saying, what you're, what you're, 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 you're I, if you're if you're captured by mainstream media and the story and the meta story they're giving us, sure, yeah. But in fact, there's a lot of ferment around the country that we don't see on these news. Yeah, I, I guess I would I would I would modify my statements to say I'm not I'm not seeing it in as powerful and strong a way as I'd like to see it. I'm saying you need to get out more. <laughs> no, I watched CNN. I watched the commentary. I watched, you know, what all the what all the pundits um, were saying by way of pushback. All right, and that wasn't that wasn't missing. Um, but Stuart, that's how how uh, nations fall apart. That's how civil wars start, right? I mean, because you have population groups that are so dug in. Uh, and 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 so bitter, you know, in 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 their in their opposing each other. Uh, I mean, look at Sudan. Sudan just fell apart because you had two conflicting powers, and that can be influenced from the outside. That's the really scary part, right? Because if you want to undermine a nation, you know, then you support something like the Trump and Marker movement, you know, and 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 boost that up because you know it it paralyzes us as a country. Right? I mean, it makes it very difficult for us to please to preserve our position in 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 global commerce, conflicts, what have you. This is a really scary moment. and and I, so far, there is no clear path how to get out of this mess without breakage, right? i I completely agree, Klaus. I, I completely agree with everything you just said. So I just want to note that, um, this we've been seduced by the power conversation. Um, we haven't completed check-in, and I want to make sure everybody has a chance to do that. And I'm happy to have this conversation. This actually, I think, would be a great topic. Power would be an awesome topic for a call. Yeah. Um, but I just want to make sure people have a chance to recenter and come back and check in if they've not done that so far. So, uh, Patty, you had your hand up. You want to go ahead? You can you can keep going on this if you want, but I I just want to create a space for folks to come back in. Hey. I was just going to invite um, reintroducing the the practice of taking uh, selectively taking a breath before shares and creating some space in the in the moving conversation would be my request. Um, I enjoy that and I appreciate that. That was all Thank I was going to say. Thank you. And before I forget, I would like to add that I think when we do talk about power, we spend a lot of time talking about how we give our power away, but I think we need to take a look at how we grab for other people's power, because that's something that we can then look at ourselves and see how we do that and how that then scales up. Thank you. Klaus, please. You're muted. You're muted. You're muted, Klaus. Does that really happen to me? <laughs> <laughs> I posted uh, uh, a video from this Dr. Mac Kilchrist here, uh, which really captured my attention. It was really an amazing talk. So the guy is basically focused on uh, the brain hemisphere, left brain and right brain. And in this conversation, he's pondering, you know, that um, our, our Western culture is left brain dominant, uh, which causes a conflict in the right brain that leads actually to a disassociation from reality. So we live in a deluded world because the right brain is, is into sense-making modes 
that uh, may not make any sense. I mean, that, that, that create a distorted uh, perception of reality, right? And um, I, I thought it was, it was really, I mean, basically he, he thinks that Western culture is in a state of schizophrenia um, induced by uh, the way that we make sense of reality, you know, of the, of the natural world around us. Um, and and that, that leads us to this you know, ex exploitation and and a, a destructive way of living. Um, but I think I mean I don't have enough. I mean it's a really complex topic. I mean it's a very rich conversation. I mean if you have time to listen in, uh, I think it's really worthwhile because I think there's more to it. You now because they are they are right brain dominant cultures, right? Um, who are expressing themselves in in one way, and then there is the Western civilization, which is left brain dominant, uh, causing all kinds of of uh, of issues in the way that we structure and organize our society. Uh, so I don't know if anybody uh, uh, has more on this. I, I just you know, thought it was a fascinating uh, introduction to to trying to understand us ourselves. Uh, to that point, going back to what um, I had posted from Curtis Ogden around uh, abstraction, the left brain takes things apart, analyzes them, abstracts them. The right brain is holistic and sees things in context. And when you have a left brain dominant uh, stance on anything, you're you're not going to see the whole picture. You're going to start to to abstract things, and then if you don't put them back together, you get into trouble, as we all are right now. Doug. You got to it's a little it's a little bit orthogonal klaus but i think relevant to, to where you just went um so there's a there's a friend of mine who's, who's one of the fathers of of um bioacoustics recording in the natural world in the wild um named bernie kraus and his phd thesis was on something called the niche hypothesis which was the biome in a particular location is the way it is because each of the, the creatures that landed there found their frequency open and clear to be able to communicate with each other. That was the de defining factor. And every location is unique in terms of that mix. And But one of the other dimensions of it is that in the natural world and, and as living beings, each living being has its own frequency, vibrational frequency energetically as part of its intrinsic vitality, like the living dimension of being a living creature. And, um, and Bernie posited what he, what he referred to as nature deficit disorder, that not being exposed to that mix of frequencies and energetic vibrations and fields over time produces psychosis. Mm. And that on a global and cultural level, everything that we have done in terms of the Western developed world is to cut us off and insulate us from um, that, those domains, energetic vibrational domains and actually electric, electromagnetic uh, domains in terms of being insulated from the earth with shoes and concrete and all of the rest, which, which is all about separating and severing any connection, vital connection to the natural world around us. Uh, and I, I think that's sort of intrinsic to the same subject domain you just pointed to. Thanks, Doug. Well, I can check in. Um, speaking of power, uh, the other day I was um, coaching a man who works for a very large international bank. And I said, what do you do? He said, well, I start, how'd you get into this work? He said, I started out as a lawyer and then I became a prosecutor against financial crimes. And now I work for an audit division of a large international bank. And I seize the assets of people who are like Russian oligarchs. And I thought, that is so cool. I'm really glad someone's doing that. And that's a 
that's power and that's the the power to go and take someone's assets and freeze them you know it's it's institutional power uh, right and it's it's um it's a power granted by the force of the state um in creating a a, a banking system that allows this to happen so um I just it, it, it was a really interesting conversation. I, I enjoyed talking to this guy a lot. We had a you know a really good connection, but um, it just made me feel good to know that this is actually happening. In other news, um, my friend Gil here and I we host these monthly calls called Living Between Worlds, and we're in conversation around the next call. And and this is related to this call in some ways. Of I'm really interested in looking at the future and in, in envisioning and imagining a future that works where we are on a planet that works for everybody, where the governance is set up so that all human beings and all life in the system is taken care of. Um, how often people, when you start to talk about this, they they come up with, oh, well, you know, you can't change human nature. And that's, that's a really nice idea, but, you know, the systems that are in place are never going to allow that. And, you know, um, and I, I find that that is a statement about their worldview, not about the actual world itself. Um, that's kind of where you come up to the limits of your worldview. It says, I can't imagine this. It's been tossed around in OGM before um, that it's easier to imagine the end of the world than the end of capitalism. And I think this is part of our, our problem. We have a, a lack of imagination. And I wish Doug um, C was still with us because I'd like to hear his thoughts on this. But um, I'm really curious to know if people have uh, a way of observing when they bump up against the limits of of their worldview of, gee, you know, um, I'd love to see the world work, but man, it's such a mess and, and people are the way they are and it's never going to happen. So I might as well just be happy that I lived when I did. And, you know, I'm, uh, I'm not going to worry about what comes after me, which I find to be a, a moral lapse. Um, you know, we are all embedded in the flow of humanity. We don't get to say, I had my time and my peace and I got my stuff and sorry about all the rest of you coming after me because that does not, in my mind, live up to what our, our debt to life is. I'm reading David Graeber's Debt the First 5,000 Years and there's a lot of cultures that see when you're born, you owe a debt to society because people gave up resources to bring you into the world and you take up, you know, you, it takes a village. People have to sacrifice in order to raise you up and 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 make you into a, a, a mature human being. And so just by virtue of being born and living, you owe a debt to people around you. And um, I think that's one of the things that's really, that's an abstraction we've done in our weird cultures, Western industrialized, rich, educated, democratic cultures, where we think, Hey, you know, it's just me. I'm just a, I'm just a, a billiard ball, bop, you know, bopping around. So, um, how? My question is, how can we be more aware of when our um, we bump up against the limits of our own individual worldview, which we take to be the limits of the world, because there's way more beyond what we can see or think about. And if we put them together. Uh, Instead of saying, well, that's how it is, we start to say, well, what do you think? Oh, you think that? Well, that's interesting. Maybe there is a chance, you know? So how do we collectively get into imaginal spaces where we can start to think about what a world that works for everybody really could look like without worrying that that can't happen because you can't change human nature and human nature says you're always going to have war and you're always going to have, you know, people, you know, grabbing everything they can for themselves. That is a story that we tell ourselves, but it is not one that that has held up throughout history because we only have this tiny little piece of history, Western history. You know, we think everything started with the Greeks. Well, you know, there was a long period of history before the Greeks came along. Um, so anyway, that's just stuff that's that's on my mind. Um, and if you want to engage in more of this, come to next Wednesday's Living Between World calls at uh, at noon Pacific uh, to one thirty. It'll be gonna be. It's going to be wild. Be there. <laughs> it's, every, it's, it's, it's third Wednesday of every month. And the title is Living Between Worlds. But the subtitle is With Grace, Dignity, and Power. So this power conversation has been threaded throughout for the past four years, sometimes explicitly, sometimes in the background. Um, it's going to get interesting for the rest of this year, depending on if I have anything to say about it. Do you see the link, Patty? Just, just scroll up, you'll see Gil's um, 
Edmonton Worlds. There's a, a link there. I do. Thank you. Missed it. And and moral imagination, which is uh, from Phoebe Tickell in London, and it speaks can to some of what you were talking about, uh, and some very elegant rocket ways. And in fact, Phoebe and uh, McGilchrist have a conversation together. McGilchrist is all over the place lately in dialogues, seventy-five minute dialogues with lots of interesting people, and one of them is with Phoebe. Cool. Still here. Patty, you have your hand up. Uh, was that a? rhetorical question uh Kevin you're asking like how how do we notice when we're bumping into the edges of our no world? I'm happy to hear it's not rhetorical it's it's definitely if you've got a, I think a take is. on that please let it know yeah I think I think personally I, I I pick up on that when I hear in my own um you know in my mind I hear the language that's like it doesn't always actually sound like doesn't apply to me, but it's iterations of doesn't apply to me. Um, I'll, I'll hear stuff like that, but it also usually is combined with it. It's like a somatic, um, it's like a visceral sense of, it's not resignation. It's It feels kind of like a flatness or a dullness. I'll notice it there. Um, definitely if I feel um, like afraid, if I feel, if I'm hearing about something I don't understand and I'll, I'll clock in or check in or check that I'm, I'm noticing like a sense of like tightness or unease, um, that, that can be for me a cue that like, oh wait, is this something like, what is this? Oh, I don't think I actually understand what this is or what this means. Um, you know, is there something for me to learn here? The answer is, you know, yes. Right. Um, most of the time, um, yeah, I, I think, I think, those are the ones that come to mind uh, immediately and most easily for me. Thank you. That's great. And good somatic awareness. It's lovely. Gil, you said you wanted to check in and we haven't heard from Carl or Mark and welcome Mike. Thanks for joining us for, for the second time today. <laughs> Mike, like me, has been hopping between calls. I'm also uh, taking care of appliances and all sorts of other things. <laughs> Sorry. Yeah. No worries, you're here. You know, you, whoever comes to the right people, whoever at the, whenever you show up is the right time. So that's my philosophy. The the one thing I'll say by way of check in, Ken, is um, when I was thinking about it earlier on when I was when I was uh, declaiming about power um, and you know, how, uh, sharing all kinds of announcements at grand philosophical scale, and I'm struck by the. I'm not going to say conflict. I'm not going to say tension. The dance between the grand perspective and the perspective of my personal life, uh, grappling with decisions that I need to make as you know, as a uh, as a a, a, a graying family uh, in a um, uh, what to say in a very messy society, um, and you know the financial and health management and strategic and logistic. Et cetera, and relational decisions to make in the midst of that very concretely. Um, and I just noticed myself, you know, listening. Uh, I was saying things about there is no force, right? There's yielding to demands or not. Um, and it's easy to say that in my direct personal life, it often feels like there's force. Um, and so it takes a real settling down and stepping back and looking for clarity to see oh no no even even though it may feel like that on the face of it in fact there are there's an array of choices and consequences that i can look at more dispassionately uh, i mean doug doug c is not here anymore i was intrigued that doug c talked about that the i was decrying the shift from power as a physics metaphor to a power as an emotional metaphor. He said, no, no, the Greeks actually had it back before as an emotional metaphor. Uh, so I'm intrigued by that and how we, um, how we form and navigate our interpretations um, as we move through the world. Uh, and so I'm very present to that both on a, you know, sort of philosophical ontological political strategic perspective and at a personal relational you know me my wife our family our friends but also our clients and our colleagues and the organizations of our clients so very ramifying scale so um that's sort of a rambly check-in to say that i'm um i'm grateful for that particular mess of thoughts 
and what it might open up. And um, I was I was talking with my friend Chauncey Bell yesterday, who reminded me that what's um, that the answers are never as interesting as the questions. <laughs> That's why I'm an Episcopalian. In <laughs> church with all the questions. Great, Mike. That's why I'm a Jew. Terrific. <laughs> <laughs> but you're 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 special because not only do you have good questions, you always have five answers, <laughs> which means more questions, right? Of course, well, that comes from being a Jew. Put put three Jews in a room, you get twelve twelve opinions. So yeah. you know. <laughs> Is it is it my turn? <laughs> yeah, sure. Go ahead. Okay. I, I didn't I didn't wait the obligatory twenty seven seconds, um, but this has been a, a an emotional week or two. Um, uh, on the high side, uh, tomorrow the final paperwork on selling my house where I've lived for thirty years. Oh. And luckily, we seem to have timed it pretty well. It's a nice spring day. The house looks better than it's ever looked. Uh, flowers all around. And uh, more importantly, uh, I live in a neighborhood where there's not a lot of turnover. And right now, nobody is selling their house in the DC area because they have 5%, they have 3% mortgages. And if they're going to sell and buy something new, they have to buy a, have to take on a 6% mortgage. Mm -hmm. um, I'm newly married. And so I'm living with my wife and her townhouse now and we don't need a house and so we just got rid of that don't have to mow lawns or anything like that anymore um so that's a huge weight off my shoulders it took more than a year to organize 30 years of my life that was in the basement um thank god for storage lockers i still have a lot more uh organizing to do uh, just as an aside, that whole exercise has been fascinating because a lot of the boxes in the basement were records from my days in the White House mm. and, um, and 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 tying into what Gil just said, going back and seeing all the forces that were at play in the in the 90s when we were trying to get the Internet commercialized and build e-government, all these different forces and the different agencies all pushing against each other. As a physicist, I always thought of things that way. On the downside, last Friday, early early last Friday morning, my uh, college roommate, one of my oldest and closest friends, passed away from aggressive brain cancer, mm. and we had his uh, funeral yesterday. And the good side of that was my daughter and I and my wife got in the car and we drove up to Bryn Mawr, and drove back on the same day, and we had, you know six six and a half hours of really interesting conversation and it was also wonderful to see my um college roommate's wife and three kids and his two brothers and people i've known since i was 18. Uh, i obviously didn't know his kids and, and his, but uh, i was the best man at his wedding in 1985. so it's uh it's hard and it's hard to see somebody disappear 20 years early you know that's just not fair yeah, my condolences, Mike. Yeah. And that's also really the first person in my generation that I've lost. So mm. I'm sure some of you have had to people that uh, you were close to, but it's it's uh, mm -hmm. hard. It's also hard. You know, I, I I got to give the toast at his wedding and I gave a eulogy last, yesterday and it, it's sort of coming mm -hmm. I mean, full circle. Very poignant. One thing that I'll mention since, you know, good, bad, good. Um, in about seven hours, I hop on a plane to San Francisco to go to Bit West. Does anybody know Alistair Kroll? Yes. Yes. Well, he has organized something called Bit North. Sort of Canadian visionaries, startups, provocateurs. Um, it's a little bit like food camp for Canadians. But they're doing a Silicon Valley version. So Canadian Silicon Valley other people from places like Washington, D.C. And it's just, uh, it, it's, uh, it may be a little intense. It's, it sounds like it's going to be 24 hours, uh, 48 hours of OGM check-ins. <laughs> 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 we're all supposed to share something we're crazy about that doesn't have to do with our work. And you know, how many of you might? Makes it feel? Pardon me? How many of you will, you will there be there? It looks like about 40. Uh-huh. 
school. We were actually hanging out in a private school in Berkeley. They're just taking over the school for the weekend, sleeping cool. on, you know, bringing sleeping bags and and uh, uh, camp mats and. Boot camp for Canadians sounds like flannel camp, right? <laughs> <laughs> Mike, I'm in I'm in Berkeley, so if you want an escape from those folks or have a few minutes, want to grab a cup or go for a walk, let me know. Well, what's your what's your morning look like? Because I was planning to be on I'm camp. Morning, which day? Tomorrow. Oh, um, not. Sorry. Okay. Well, I, I'm also available little after lunch. Um, let me look here. Tomorrow. I'll, let's take it off. Yeah. I was going to say, if you can send me your uh, your text. Mark, I'll, Carl, would either, I'm sorry, Mike, didn't cut you off. I'm just going to send you my uh, my phone number and you can text me there. Thanks, Thanks. Mike. I knew I, I knew I needed to get on this call. Yeah, there you go. Mark, Carl, would either you like to check in before we close out in a few minutes? I'm not hearing you. It doesn't look like you're muted, but I can't hear you. Doug is back. I had the problem that I needed to check in with the Napier discussion. Oh. Uh, um, and I realized I probably have a, some personal stories about Napier that the people in the group didn't have. Uh, for example, at one point, Napier hired my son uh, when he was 16 to do some more project work for GBN. And that became a glue between the three of us. That had lots of impact. Nice. Did you want to check in, Doug, while you're here? You... Um, I kind of thought I did, but maybe I didn't. It was I a actually, long time ago. It wasn't a long time ago. Yeah, sorry, you did actually, but um, <laughs> <laughs> well, my brain I, gets full from these calls. Hard to track everything. I guess the the two stories are that I'm in Montenegro uh, on the Adriatic on purpose, and that is living in Northern California, I felt fairly remote from climate change effects and conversations. And I think this part of the world is gonna get hit really hard this summer with water problems, temperature problems, and maybe even food problems. And I wanted to be closer to the conversations in a kind of anthropological way. So I've put myself here, I don't know for how long, 90 days, maybe even more uh, to experience this. And it's already paid off a lot by providing me with images that I would never have thought of, which is time for another story at another time. Uh, the other part of the check-in might be my continual puzzlement of, uh, over how people think about climate change or don't think about it uh, or think about it and don't talk. Uh, and I come down to, you know, the US historically is a problem solving society. That's what we think we're good at. And we're not doing hardly anything to frame climate change as a problem to solve. And I'm really curious about that. Carl, did you want to reveal yourself to us and say anything? Okay, Mark, did, are you, can you speak now? Is your computer accepting your voice? Is it working now? Yes, it is working now. Great, yeah. Um, again, uh, condolences to Mike. Um, it's hard to lose people. And um, one of the things about uh, climate change in California, um, with all the growth, um, I'm anticipating some wildfires. Oh, yeah. Yeah. So um, 
Uh, it's a super bloom out. Um, it's beautiful. Um, there's this gorgeous um, flowers, and I'm noticing uh, lots of insects. Um, when I grew up in uh, um, the Imperial Valley, um, when there was a lot of uh, vegetation, there came a lot of insects as well, and um, you know predators and and basically uh, you know the, all of nature kind of is exploding. So I'm kind of uh, hoping that uh, we don't get covered in pesticides um, from all the uh, all the insects that are going to be coming out for uh, um, the biological party, as well as the uh, unfortunately the uh, um, all the grass and um, underbrush that's going to be growing up and um, well, uh, we will see. Um, Doug, I'm sorry, Gil, go ahead. Yeah, um, <clears throat> I'm, I'm remembering Mark. Uh, I was at a conference some years ago about California futures and at a panel with um, an executive from Cal Fire, an executive from the real estate industry, and an executive from the insurance industry. They were talking about how the two prior years had been the fiercest fire seasons, at least in recent memory, if not in California history. Um, and uh, came Q and A, and the question that I asked was like, if that was the if that what the last two years were, what's your plan for this year and next year? And so help me God, they said the plan is to hope that it's not as bad. Mm -hmm. And of course, you know, <laughs> wrong. <laughs> uh, so anyway, that's all. We could go. We could go. We could go deep on that one. I would remind that hope is not a plan. Yeah. Yeah. We're talking uh, about hope before you got here. Sure. Hope and power before you got here. Go back and listen to the recording. <laughs> yeah. All right. Well, that brings us to time. Uh, thank you all for showing up today and your patience. Um, uh, is there a poem? That, you know, because I've been moderating, I didn't have time to look through my, my poems, so I have to give you one from memory. Um, Even better. Uh, okay, this is Roca, and I've probably re I've probably offered this before, but you know I only have a few in memory. So this is called the Winged Energy of Delight, and it does re it does relate to today's calls in many ways to topics on today's call in many ways. So just as the winged energy of delight carried you over many chasms early on, now raise high the daringly imagined arch, holding up the astounding bridges. Miracle does not lie only in the amazing living through and defeat of danger. Miracle becomes miracle in the clear light of achievement that is earned in the world. Working with things is not hubris when building associations beyond words. For denser and denser the pattern becomes, and being carried along is no longer enough. So, Take your well-disciplined strengths and stretch them between two opposing poles, because inside the human heart is where God learns. I wish you all a great week. It's lovely to see you today. Have fun. Bye-bye. Have a great day. <laughs>